Thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Ramya Sundaram, as many of you know. I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Uh, this is our second lecture in our summer series. Today, uh, we have Tom Jackson from NOAA to talk about the uh, resurgence of small tooth sawfish um, in uh, Biscayne Bay. Um, we also have Laura McDonald, who is a PhD student with the Shark Research Center, who's going to talk about what they are doing. Um, we're actually, we're all working together. I'm, I'm doing a lot of logistics work, and they're doing, they're in fact, putting the tags in the sharks and things, so yeah. as an example. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if anybody is interested in um, hearing about future lectures or getting our um, monthly, news, or not monthly, sorry, quarterly newsletter, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Feel free to sign up. And I'm available for any questions that may come up about our programming or anything else like that. And with that, I'll hand it off to you, Tom. Well, how y'all doing? I used to live in the Key from 1989 to 1999. Um, I have worked on terns and sea turtles and marine mammals and venomous snakes and spiders, and I never in my life thought that I would end up working on sharks. Uh, it was kind of ironic and, and sawfish. Um, and these, these guys have been actually working at Razos under Dr. Neil Hammerslog for a number of years. They have a fantastic shark research program across the street, but I really had no contact or work with them because I had no overlap. So the first most important thing that we need to talk about tonight is what do you do if you encounter a sawfish? It's, it's funny because even people that I know that are researchers, when they see one, it's like, ah, 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 ah. And everyone forgets, you know, get your phone, take a picture, you know, hopefully your location's on, you know, put your video on, talk about it. Those are the easiest way to take notes. Videos are great. You can take stills. Um, but you don't want to make contact with them. And you don't want to bring it to the boat. If you see you have a sawfish on a line, just cut your line and let them go. Uh, believe me, they can damage your boat, and they can do a lot more than damage you. Uh, I, have a, I know a few people that have these wonderful little scars on their legs, some of the people that actually do some of the tagging work uh, on the West Coast. So but we, we want details like date, time, lat long, weather can be important, how close to shore, if you're close to mangroves. Um, any, anything you think is pertinent, any detail can be important. More is always better than less when it comes to details for catches. And if you've gone down to the Keys, you might have seen these signs. I think we're putting these up. And call 1-844-4-SAWFISH. Okay? You can also contact me if you want, and I have my contact information later, and I'll give people cards. And I will contact them if you forget the number or vice versa. We will make sure that that information goes to them and to the international database. So generally, you, 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 you know, do not want to remove the saw. This is a sad thing. I actually saw an animal that somebody had removed the saw from, and it was still alive when I was in Mexico. And it was, it was still living, but it was, you know, that part of its... Uh, and they're still very commonly seen on the internet, even though they're illegal. Uh, oftentimes in places that are sold as religious relics. Sometimes some of them come from Haiti. Some cultures in Asia and the Philippines have them. Um, you see them come up on Etsy. You cannot buy them. You cannot purchase them. If you own them, you better have a record for where you got them because they're actually prohibited. It's like having elephant tusks. Uh, and they, they were protected in the year 2003. You get a $510,000 fine. I have not seen anyone get a fine. There have been a number of people who have brought them to shore. Uh, thankfully, the animals, that all those animals got back into the water okay, so, so far as we know. Harassing them can cost you a lot of money. Uh, and obviously, there's a little bit of risk. I used to swim with crocodiles. I don't think I want to swim with sawfish so much. Maybe take some pictures with them, but that's about it. So what do you think a sawfish is? How many, what do you think is, it's a shark or ray? How many of you think it's a shark? Hands up if you think it's a shark. How many of you think it's a ray? Well, it's actually a ray. And, and the reason is, is because its gills are on its underside as opposed to shark. Everybody's seen the shark gills up here, and they tell you, you know, if, if you get bitten by the shark punch in the gills, good luck. Uh, but this, this is what they're talking about. And the nostrils are on the underside in a sawfish as well. So the, the gills and the nostrils are oriented just like a stingray would be, and not like a shark. And if you want to determine if it's a male or female, on the back fin, on the anal fin, you'll see there's an extension on these. This is called a clasper. And all elasmobranchs have these, all male elasmobranchs. And that includes sharks and rays and guitarfish. And these things called chimeras, which some of your kids probably know what they are, because we talk about those things in the deep sea. There's a lot of deep sea news. The females don't. They just have a regular looking fin. So if you have a decent sized individual, and you get a picture of it, you might be able to find, we might be able to tell you what sex it is. If it's under two meters, it's probably a, a juvenile, and it might have even been born somewhere in our area. Um, that's one of the things we hope at some point to find. One of the interesting things about reproduction in sawfish is they're born live. They, they aren't born in egg cases like some sharks. 
Uh, the first one was actually documented in 2012 in Atlantis in Paris, Paradise Island. They had a number of little baby sawfish that came out there. And then Dean Grubbs actually was the first person to film them uh, in 2014. And uh, it's interesting because uh, they, they also discovered, not long after that, that they're parthenogenic. Anybody know what parthenogenic means? What does it mean? Yes. So to give you an interesting parallel story, I work on invasive species. And so when I moved here and these geniuses didn't know what to do with pythons and the internet didn't exist, there was a book called The Reproductive Husbandry of Boas and Pythons, the cookbook if you want to make pythons. I had the only copy. Uh, I, 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 I lent them that book. We knew in the, in the reptile trade in the 80s of a snake that was called the Mary snake. And it was in Pittsburgh. And this snake was producing babies and it had never been in a cage with another snake. Scientists would not believe that snakes were parthenogenic. It turns out a lot of vertebrates are parthenogenic. More fish than they know are parthenogenic. Rattlesnakes are parthenogenic. Boids are parthenogenic. So part of the interesting thing about that is, so say, say you have your loose pythons and you're using the scent of the female to kill the males. What essentially, what essentially you might do is you might shift the population to being parthenogenic females. So now you have all females producing all females, which is a double the problem. Um, we haven't seen that. That hasn't been seen in pythons yet, but that, these things do happen. It, it, it does occur in nature. So, hey, hey, guess what, mommies? Uh, sawfish mommies can breathe easy because they're born with special little nubbies on their saw. Could you imagine? <laughs> oh, right? Yeah, and you thought, yeah, fiber's bad, huh? So we'll talk a little bit about conservation and recovery. Um, the, the most important thing I can tell you Everyone comes to me and says, you know so much about animals. It's because I've had lots of animals. I've had family in the past, that, like in Victorian England, where they had animals in the house. That was my family. I'll tell you one thing. If somebody comes up to me and they tell me they know a comprehensive thing about any living organism on Earth, I know they're full of it and I run from them. Because we've spent more money on investigating human medicine, mice, and E. coli bacteria than anything else. And we still can't put two people in a room now that we recognize something called biomes and know what's going to happen when someone from Kamchatka is brought in a room with a Bribri Indian from Costa Rica. What happens to these biomes? We've known in the past bad things that happened because Columbus went to, to Central and South America and brought a bunch of diseases and ended up taking syphilis back to Europe, um, which wasn't a good thing. So the most interesting thing I can tell you is, kids, we know nothing about any of the animals you're interested in. If you like butterflies, if you like tarantulas, if you like sharks, there is so much to be learned about. When I was your age, I thought, oh, they know everything. There's nothing left to learn. The exact opposite is true. And the most amazing thing is the tools are getting better. We actually have microscopes now that you can see proteins. You can see molecules. That's in the last five to 10 years. It's going to revolutionize medicine. So there is a lot, even in your backyard, to discover. And I tell you that because I found a population of what might be the second population of Miami tiger beetles. Uh, and one of the rarest endangered species in Florida, just from walking with a friend looking for lizards. So you never know, keep your eyes open, what you're gonna see walking around in Florida. Oh, where have all the sawfish gone? So, when I moved here in 99, in 1992, I remember, at that point in time, and Jaws came out in 76, and sharks bad, kill, sharks bad, kill, kill, kill. Uh, in 92, someone strung up a sawfish at, at Cranham Marina. I remember because I was biking to Erasmus. And people actually showed up, and they were angry, and they were upset. And that was the first time I made a note in my head. I was like, wow, this is a real paradigm shift. And, and George Burgess was you know, very active still then, and he was there trying to get people to not be so worried. But that was the last time I saw sawfish in Biscayne uh, Bay. The real problem has been habitat loss and mortality, us channelizing Florida, us stopping the freshwater flow that goes into the water here that used to basically, you know, we used to have oysters in, in Biscayne Bay. There are still relic oyster reefs in Biscayne Bay, not something that you'd imagine. One of the biggest problems were gill nets. So most of y'all are thankfully too young to know what gill nets are. Some of us, some of us know what gill nets are. Um, but gill nets were basically, a, you, you'd lay out a big long net and all the fish would die. So, but you'd collect the ones you wanted and you'd throw back what you didn't want. And so there were huge amounts of bycatch. Uh, if you were interested in redfish or speckled trout, you might catch 3,000 croakers and throw those croakers away. So one of the biggest fatalities were sawfish, because obviously if you've got a great big thing to entangle yourself with, you're going to get entangled on nets. And it wasn't until 1994 when they decided to put a regulation on limiting those nets that something changed. 
we didn't see it for a long time, but something changed. They're also put on the Endangered Species Act, and they're listed as an ESA species, as are every single species of sawfish in the world. There is not one type of sawfish that is not endangered. And interestingly enough, one of the reasons is we compete with them because we both love our estuaries. People like to live on the estuary, which means our runoff is going into the estuary. Our sewers are going into the estuary. That giant building they're building on Grand and uh, US-1, all those toilets are going to be going into our estuary. And those are the places where a lot of these animals depend upon, and they depend upon cl clean, fresh water. So um, they, were, they were protected in 2003. In 2009, NOAA decided, after much planning, to put aside these areas as designated critical wildlife habitat. And the thinking was this. We found some babies in these places, and we need to ensure there's some protection so that we can increase the number of babies that are produced. And possibly, if we're lucky in the future, maybe they'll be restored in other places and possibly come up, because they used to be all around the East Coast. So it stops right at the US-1 bridge. Okay? And the two most important characteristics for their juveniles, for nursery areas, are red mangrove shorelines and shallow urihaline habitats. That means where you have fresh water and salt water mixing, uh, and that's the important thing, is, is uh, like a continuous mixing of fresh water. So the boundary for this critical habitat area is, in fact, the US-1 bridge. Uh, and even though the, the mangrove and the water characteristics are identified on both of these sides, the boundary was drawn here. Okay? And essentially, it was drawn um, because it was an easy line. It was a navigational point that everyone could know. Um, there weren't any specific reasons other than that. So the recovery of small tooth sawfish really depends upon the availability and quantity of, of nursery habitats and the protection of high quality nursery habitats. And that really depends upon us producing fresh water. So in the Bay, historically, we were a hotspot for sawfish. And that changed significantly. You can see the drops in distribution. I mean, this is where we are now and this is where we were before. Each color going inward is where we're going towards the future. So a significant amount of loss of habitat because of channelization on the East Coast. The Indian River Lagoon did exactly the same thing as they did down here. They lost their sawfish, uh, I believe, first prior to them seeing them down here and in the Keys. So a lot of affected habitat and a lot of effect in the population. So why would they come back to the bay? Well, we don't really have estuaries as of yet, right? Um, we know that the estuaries are important nursery areas. All these, these seawalls and the rerouting of water and the channelization uh, have really affected how this nursery exists. Because what happens is, right now, you know, it's hurricane season. Hey, we need to pump a bunch of water out of this canal. Pump, 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 turn it off. So you end up with this event where you have a huge amount of fresh water, and then all of a sudden no fresh water. And the animals really aren't designed to deal with that on a regular basis, because they're used to the water coming in, and there being a gradient of salinity. And they choose where in that gradient they, they choose to live by their, by their preference and their physiology. So how many of you have ever heard of SERP? Anybody heard of SERP? Ta-da! Cooperative Everglades Restoration Project. This is where a lot of the congressional money has been put aside to help us fix the Everglades. And uh, I am glad to say that we are seeing progress. I'm glad to say that, that Governor DeSantis is, is pushing forward on this. Um, it's been stalled for a while. After 30 years of me living here, I, I'm a little bit more hopeful for things. And we're actually getting phase one uh, is going in phase two. So, so we're really excited about this because if we pull this off and we get fresh water in the bay, they will come. We bring them fresh water, we're going to get baby sawfish. Interestingly enough, um, there is an area just near Deering Estate where fresh water flow was started in February last year. It's, a, it's actually, the arrows are wrong. It's actually down here. I should have it down here. It's a pumping area. Um, and that's part of a, what's called a demonstration project. So in the Deering Estate, they're doing a scientific project, and they're restoring fresh water flow of the areas. And they're going in and seeing what plants change, what crustaceans change, what's the change in the fish communities, to see as the water is restored, what will restoration look like. There's also a project at NOAA called iBeam been going on for seven, uh, let's see, since 2002. I was one of the first people to start it. And they're doing monitoring along this entire shoreline. Well, they actually go and they drop quadrats, and they look at all the organisms and plants at 47 stations along the bay. Uh, so we're measuring 
for the changes of cert providing fresh water. We're out there looking to see what animals are there. So when the fresh water starts to come, we'll hopefully start seeing changes. That's why I-beam and SERP and these things are, are related or are working together to do. One of the things that's interesting is we, we're interested in this area because it's the only nursery area, possible nursery area. That's the only estuary in area that I can tell you, I know it's an estuary. And I know it's an estuary because there are otters living here. And there have been otters living here for 10 years. And the otters have, I think they have their own little face page for Deering Estate, okay? I did not know there were otters here. Do you, any, any of y'all know that we had otters in Biscayne Bay? Had no idea. I've seen them in Old Loop Road. I've seen them in, in Fakahatchee Strand. I've seen them looking for ghost orchids. Never had any idea. I honestly hope the pythons don't get them because I warned them about the pythons 12 years ago. I told them that Elliott Key and those other places are going to be ripe for the pythons because if the wind is coming from the east and you're a hungry snake and you're in the mangroves and you've eaten all the raccoons, there's Mexican squirrels on those islands. And they've already found, I think, three on Elliott Key and two on platforms. So it's happening. Thankfully, we haven't had any issues yet with this family of otters. But having a family of otters tells you you have a very strong long-term estuary area. And this is where this freshwater flow was being restored. So the collaborative project between us and SRC. SRC is the, the, the uh, Shark Research Center at Rasmus. So basically, how did this start? It was in 2014, I was watching the news with my friends having a Guinness. And everyone was freaking out in West Palm Beach because they were tracking a white shark. And all of a sudden, oh, the array stops here. We don't know where it is now. And everyone down here is like, can we swim today? No, nothing was really going to happen. But people you know, get crazy about these things. Honestly, uh, if you want to be worried about anything when you drive here to your home, it's going to be the most dangerous thing you do. I've been T-boned four times in 30 years here. And people blowing off stop signs and stoplights. Um, but anyway, so, so I knew that there was this interest in tracking sh these sharks down here. I didn't really plug into these guys yet, but I knew that there was this, this interest in this and that acoustic tracking might be something that, that could be possible. And then I found out about their work with the Florida Atlantic Coast Telemetry Acoustic Array, and that's a cooperative agreement between a lot of universities and research groups and, and governmental institutions, parks, that basically use all these acoustic arrays to track animals. So if you tag an animal and it comes through my array, I'm not gonna, it's not like you know the Locky virus where we'll give you, if you want your computer back, give us $5,000. It's not like that. If, if your animal comes through the array, you get the data, okay? Now technically, the, the person who tags the animal is owner of the data. So if we set out an array, it's kind of like in the old days where I go, okay, I'm gonna put a toll bridge here and you guys are gonna pay me money. You can't set up an array and, and, and basically co co uh, take over the data. The data is still theirs. So you have to have agreements with people for using it. But the advantage of this is now we can know when things are going around. And the interesting thing is one of the reasons why the sharks are going around Florida, they think, is they might be going south with the tuna fish. Or there might be a relation to whatever they're both going south for in that period of time. So by tracking one species, you might get information on another species. Um, I don't know if any knew Sonny Gruber. Sonny Gruber was involved in this. He was one of the shark people at Rasmus. Cancer tried to kill him. I don't know how many times. That guy was like more amazing than Deadpool. He just passed away recently. He was a very nice guy. Um, he was very involved in this. So initial reports in 2014, I had a casual conversation. I was at Fresh Market, and a man said, I saw a live small tooth sawfish. And I was thinking, you know, that's really kind of weird. I've, people call me all the time, and they see weird animals. I get the weird animal calls. It's normal. You guys called me. Actually, I was picking a gravestone for my mother, and your city called me and said, we have a crocodile in the sewer. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm in Canada. I can't help you. Uh, so after hearing that somebody saw a sawfish, I decided to start looking. And you know how easy it is for you guys to find out things? When I was young, you had to go to the library, and then we had to go to something called a Dewey Decimal Card, and then we had to pull the drawer, and then we had to find the card, and then we had to go find the book. You know, half an hour later, you had the book, and then you start looking for the information. If you want to know if there's sawfish in Biscayne Bay, the easiest thing to do is open up Google and go, sawfish in Biscayne Bay. And you know what comes up? People's Facebook pages with their photographs of sawfish. You know, people post these things on social media. Now that's a good thing, and sometimes it's not a good thing, because then you have somebody with a hammer beating up a sawfish, and they post it, and then they go to jail, obviously, for A, for being mean, and two, for being really stupid. Uh, we do that well here. But as an example, I actually found this, this account that, that no one really knew about at the International Sawfish Database in the Miami River, that one that showed up the Miami River, and I got the person in contact with the database, and about six or eight sightings 
that weren't at the International Sawfish Database, which is collected up in Gainesville at the Florida uh, Museum. Um, we've added those records. So then I kind of started talking to Neil. And we identified some common interests. And he was working with this fact array. And I'm like, oh, cool, acoustic array. We can track the sharks. And you know, I didn't really think that you know, the, I was thinking the white sharks, but the white sharks are way offshore. I mean, our agency would love to be able to have a receiver network out there to look for tuna fish and things, but we're actually working inshore in the bay. But I didn't really completely understand the system. That's why I'm doing a lot of talking, but they know more about this than I do, to be honest with you. I used to be a car salesman. That's why I'm good at doing this. It's true. Uh, so it was a rare conversation for me to find a, a live sawfish. And then, and then, again, having the history of seeing it in Crandon, it was really a benefit to run into Neil and a student he had at the time, Rob Romer. And they said, listen, we can possibly start an array here to fix that gap that's missing in the north. And we're interested in sawfish. Or they're interested in hammerhead sharks, uh, lemon sharks, and nurse sharks, and bull sharks. All the sharks, yeah. <laughs> Pick your favorite shark sharks. Yeah. And our, Noah's interest is, is in sawfish because we have an ESA program. So we figured that we could work, collaborate together. And at this time, around 2014, uh, our office was chosen as one of 10 places in the United States to have a habitat focus area. And what this meant for Noah was they were going to give us a bunch of money, and we were going to spend it on a whole bunch of projects. Like, uh, how many of you all know uh, water keepers? Ta-da! Love water keepers. OK, so, so water keepers has actually benefited from this program. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get as much money as some of the other ones got, but we did a lot more than some of the other ones got. So we're, we're going up to the meeting in September. We're going to go, hey, look what we did for half the money. Uh, anyway, uh, so Chris Kebble, who's at AOML, is doing the water study. You might have seen some of his, his uh, articles in the newspaper about the water studies they were doing in the Coral Gables waterway. And the city's actually talking to them about making changes and looking at septic tanks. And Dr. Joan Browder, who has uh, been working here for a long time, who uh, is, is, is a little old lady, but she's a firecracker, and she can pull in more money in grants than any of you. Uh, I've known her for a really long time. She's been around at the onset of Biscayne Bay, of Biscayne National Park. And I've, I'm happy to say that I still work with her. And I, she says I'm going to retire before her. So she got on her granddaughter's pogo stick five years ago. I wouldn't do that, OK? Biscayne Bay Habitat Focus Area was designated in 2014. And the, really, the most important things are to improve, improve water quality, because if any of you have lived here long enough to walk to Cranon Beach, you've seen it change, right? It was not like what it was when I was younger, when I, when I lived in Ocean Village. Uh, we want to build knowledge about protected species habitat. We want to increase to protect the freshwater inflow. And then in the activities, we have the acoustic array. And that's what we've been working on. Boy, we've had, uh, what, two hurricanes? Two hurricanes? Yeah, it's like we put the equipment out hurricane. We've got to go check everything. Uh, yeah, we, Irma was the second one. What was David was the first one? It was a near miss. So it's basically a collaboration between our group and actually the people that are doing the boots and the groundwork. And that's the, the shark, that's these people. That's the, the Shark Research Center with Dr. Hammerschlag. And here is Dr. H. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting anecdotal story. I've worked with people in the past with dangerous animals, and they like like they're the they're the researcher and you're the you're the plebe, and they're can you go between me and that animal? Now they put you in the situations where you're in the danger situation. I got a call from him. I was in Hawaii on vacation. He's like, uh, you know, there's a shark carcass. There's a whale carcass. And I want to know if, if we can approach it, because there's tiger sharks in the water, and I want to snorkel and film them. And, and so he gets the OK from Noah, and he does his filming. And later, unlike in the old days, where it would have been, hey, graduate student, take the camera and go film the shark. You hear him, get out of the way. And I'm not kidding you. There's this, this, this tiger shark comes up from the bottom. Heads over there, comes straight up to him, turns left and goes that way. It was, what is it, seven adult tiger sharks? How many tiger sharks was it in that? Five. So, so in the old days, it would be meat, go in the water. And so I have a lot of respect for this guy because you know, he, he's, he's not putting them in trouble. And uh, I, I actually learned a lot from getting in the water with crocodiles before anybody told me you couldn't do it. I didn't know you couldn't do it. So that's kind of how it happened. But you learn a lot from being up close with these animals sometimes. If you get home with your fingers, it's a good day. Uh, sea turtles are amazing. I have, friends, I have more, actually, with all these guys, I have more sea turtle friends that are missing fingers because they put their hand in the bucket with a sea turtle, you know, <laughs> and they don't think. <laughs> ah! So yeah, I thought it was squid. So, so they actually do a lot of tagging in Biscayne Bay. And these are photographs of some of their tagging activities. So they put this pipe, right, and they, they bring the shark up on a platform. They put a pipe in its mouth. They run oxygenated water across its gills. And they surgically implant a tag. And these tags actually make sound. And they each make a different frequency. So one is making ping, and the other is making pong, just for, for reference. How do you track fish? 
I love these comments. I got that one in Malibu, got that one in Guadalupe. It is funny because people, there's all these different kinds of tags, and I actually have seen multiply tag fish before. But NOAA actually uses a couple different kinds of tags um, for, for sawfish. We have a, what's called a roto tag, and we have what's called an acoustic tag. If you see a sawfish with a tag on it, just make sure you get a picture. I don't care if it's blurry, just so that we can see that it has a roto or a, because chances are, especially if it has an acoustic tag, we might have had it go by our receivers. And so that would corroborate a timing and a location for us that you might have seen it elsewhere. That's Dr. John Carlson. He works for NOAA. He's in the water getting a, a sawfish ready to tag. That's a pretty precarious place to be, yeah? I'll tell you, I used to work at a vet clinic. I would rather hold a cobra than a cat any day because a cobra's got one weapon, a cat has five. You take a temperature on a cat, you're in trouble. I would not want that job. Small tooth sawfish in the bay and, habit and our habitat focus area. Uh, how can we, how um, has the HFA cooperative research documented sawfish? So what are the methods we've used to find sawfish in the bay? One is the acoustic array. We talked a little bit about that. And again, we, they, they basically, we, we, uh, I'll explain how we do it in a second. There's something called a BRUV. I'll explain that in a minute. That's an underwater video camera. It's incidental captures, that's where you go, you're going out and you're trying to catch something and you catch something else you didn't expect. And then again, reports in the public where we found reports uh, and, and gotten them back to the International Sawfish Database. So there's two parts in an array. You have an acoustic receiver, and it's actually about this big. And, and Mitch has to make these cement platforms with a rebar that this gets uh, zip tied to around this little strap here. And uh, we attach that to, to this rebar and a little platform. We take it out to different parts of the bay and we deploy it. And about six months later, we come back and bring it back to the office. Now the implanted tag, this, this is the hearing device. The other part of it is the part that makes the sound. This is obviously, that's a penny, so this is obviously not that big. It's, it's about that large. So these are actually surgically implanted in the vent of the animal with a few stitches. They put them underneath and they have a battery in them. The amazing thing as time goes on, the batteries have gotten so good, they have tags on dragonflies now. It was amazing, I saw that last week. So yeah, the tag. Yeah, pretty soon they're going to be flying around looking at us. I don't care. I have nothing. I, I have nothing to, to be ashamed of with these people anymore. I'm not worried. Uh, so again, we deploy it. Here's one actually out in a, in a place called Sandwich Cove, which has a lot of sea fans and sea whips, and uh, it's really, really pretty nice. So we have the unit in the water. Here they are cutting and implanting the tag. Um, they actually were on Shark Tank. They had a, a special uh, edition of Shark Tank where they were doing shark researchers. And uh, this group had a special program to get young girls back into science. So they didn't win, but I thought that was kind of, kind of a neat thing. I heard about it after the fact. So they, they're out there on the boat, putting the tag in. They put the shark back in. Shark swims around. And as it passes, it has to be a certain distance. Is it 800 meters when it's in deep water? About. about. So it's about 800 meters. So if you, the problem is if you put it in a shallow place, you really limit how far you can track things because you end up getting bounce backs of signals and you have problems in receiving signals. So this is actually how many receivers there are out. And believe me, it is hell to get all these out and back. I've had three back surgeries. I've had 300 discs. These guys have to put up with a lot as an old guy driving the boat. But we have ones now on the reef. This is new as of last year. On all the barrier islands, South Beach, Government Cut, Key Biscayne, Fisher Island, all the way down, Mercy, uh, Deering Estate. Uh, we have some uh, by... Uh, Turkey Point, and the furthest south one actually is the exit canals by Turkey Point. We have one just south of that. Um, we have some over here by Broad Key, uh, but, but the number, the array has gotten really large. It started off with a couple, and, and every time they say, can we put in more? I'm like, no, because we have one boat that kind of works, and yeah, if, when it's not working, it's a problem. And the weather has not been cooperating sometimes. But, uh, so, so there's a lot, lot of out there, and just to let you know, because, again, the ownership of data is from all the people that actually tag the animals. We're working on a publication in, in, in collaboration with these, with these individuals. But there have been multiple adult small tooth sawfish detected staying and moving around throughout the array. Now, the most interesting thing about this for me was when this started, if I had gotten a dollar from every person that said, you're never going to see a sawfish. I mean, it was like every other person. You're not going to find us. You're never going to find a sawfish. Honestly, I really didn't think, I wasn't sure I could. I knew I'd have a good chance from that guy's call. But, but we found more than five, and we don't know how many more than that, that have come through our area. And that's five more than anyone knew were coming through our area. Uh, so so we've, as a start, we've, we've brought new sightings to the, to the database. We've you know, created this array that helps. And so this helps any kind of species that comes through here, any acoustically tagged fish, a turtle, 
a shark. That data goes to all those researchers. So it benefits, I don't know how many research institutions, but it's a lot. So a BRUV is another way that they're doing some sampling. And it basically means a baited remote underwater video. This is my kind of rudimentary method of making a diagram. So you have your camera, you have your bait box, and you have your, you have Catherine the shark approaching your bait box. Uh, and they actually are deploying them to look for sharks. And, and, and some, some of them in nursery habitats, they were looking for lemon sharks. And lemon sharks um, actually overlap with sawfish in nursery areas. So we do have some overlap in, in the things that we're looking for. So you deploy the, the, the camera at the bottom. You leave it down for a few hours. You come back, you pick it up, and you download the video. And no one expected sawfish, but they got a number of sawfish. And the nice thing about this one is, we talked about earlier, that's a female. And it's a pretty good sized female. You can't tell how big it is, but it's still a good sized female. Um, by the way, in, in the area that we're interested in, someone found a near two meter sawfish in 2013. A guy named Bob Ball, he used to be the, the coordinator for Mercy Hospital. He was out there in his kayak. So there's a possibility that sawfish have birthed somewhere between the US-1 bridge and here. Not necessarily here, we don't know. But we're looking for females. Because obviously if we see a lot of big females, there's a possibility of them coming in and, and having babies. Now they have also found males. The other thing interesting about BRUVs, that's a cobia. Uh, uh. Okay, this one's facing with the big fence. I know I should use a pointer, right? I'm, I'm sorry, kick. Okay. So we get, uh, we get other data. We got cobia, we got red grouper, and they got tallfish. So you see, you actually, in this technique, you get a lot more data. Now, here, there are arguments about this technique. So essentially, if you do this a lot and you do this in the same place, you could be changing an animal's behavior, right? So um, one thing I'll say, it's kind of like that. Well, that's kind of like what we do when we go fishing, right? We're all fishing, we're all putting bait in. That's similar. So there, there, are, there are things you have to understand in, in these kinds of methods. There are a lot less impact than, say, trying to, to capture the animal. Or, or It is one way of, of seeing animals. But you might be, say, bringing them in an area and filming them. They might have been over there, but they came over here, and they might not necessarily have been over here. So, so those considerations have to be taken into account. In uh, April of 2004, 18, April 11th, I was on the phone with my invasive species call, and I got this text. We just caught a sawfish. And I said something really bad on the invasive species call, and I said, I really have to go like now, 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 hung up my phone, because they caught a sawfish. The first one in Biscayne Bay in 30 years. Right here. Okay. So um, if you don't know where this is, um, we call this Pleasant Point. What, do you, what is this technical term for this? Say again? During a state area. So during a state, yeah, is, is down here. OK, this is, this is a canal that comes in. There's a row of houses here. This is actually our I-beam station number one. I've gone to this place. There's a manatee here named Larry who has a tendency of coming over and bumping you if you're in the water and you're doing sampling. He's kind of funny. And you can't see. You can only see that far because he just kind of shows up and people scream. But so they caught a sawfish here. First one in 30 years. No, uh, you're never going to find a sawfish. That wasn't the only one, by the way. There were a few others. And they weren't going out looking for sawfish, they were going out drum lining for sharks. They were trying to find lemon sharks and bull sharks in the bay to put tags in. So just by chance, they happened to catch a sawfish. When they caught this sawfish, about three months before that, uh, uh, Baram at FIU, who's managing the, the uh, demonstration project at Deering Estate, the, the pumping project, started to increase the freshwater flow, and the flow went from 12 on and 12 off to 24 hours on continuous. And it's been 24 hours on continuous since February of last year. And in April, the sawfish shows up. So we're hoping that this restoration effort in this area with a whole bunch of otters, that's definitely an estuary, might add up to us getting baby sawfish in Biscayne Bay. Um, would be nice. So these are actually, I just got this today. So these are the water monitoring stations f for Biscayne National Park System. And this is where that incidental catch was. Again, here's the otters and here's during estate. So there's a lot of water sampling effort. Um, the fact that this water was starting when the sawfish showed up was, a, again, a casual conversation at a meeting three weeks ago with a Derm employee. And I said, hey, you know, we caught a sawfish here. He said, well, you know the, that Baram was releasing fresh water there, and the demonstration project was in full force. And I think that those two are, are connected. So we're now talking, and Derm and, and some of the other people that are involved in SERP are interested because sawfish are a pretty good ambassador for restoration. 
If we get baby sawfish here, that's a pretty good sign of some level of restoration, which would be nice. I don't know if you all saw the article about the seagrass. Did, did anybody see the article about the seagrass between here and Key West? As high as 96% of our seagrass has died. Wow. Yeah. Uh, two years ago, Julie Tuttle Causeway, which when I moved here, was the best place to catch speck trout and redfish. Whole die off in 2016, 17. Uh, we do not know why. We are not sure if, there, if we've hit environmental cascades and tipping points, but the habitat is seriously getting hit. One thing that's odd is sawfish come to the most horrible places. The Miami River, yuck. I don't want to go there. I certainly wouldn't want to have babies there. But one of the places that they, that that you know, we find sharks is right downtown in the Turning Basin, where the boats turn around by the Frost Museum. Right there. You know, you'd think they'd be as far away from there as possible, but they find things like hammerhead sharks living in these places. They're actually studying sharks in the urban environment. They want to know what are sharks doing in relation to the city. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting questions. Do lights affect sharks? Do sound affect sharks? Mitch is actually trying to track sounds in the bay and see if they affect different kinds of animals. We have another researcher at my office that's looking at sea turtles, and they're looking at sea turtle behavior in the bay. So we have people out there measuring water, and we, we have people looking at sawfish, and hopefully you know, we'll be able to find some in the next two years. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, our efforts have doubled the documented sightings in Biscayne Bay. Uh, and we've added to the, to the International Sawfish Database. We've added a number of sightings. Helen Albertson, I don't know if any of you know her. She was the librarian when I was a young man at Rasmus. She is now our librarian. She did a great job of going back and finding 15 sightings all the way back to 1908 in Biscayne Bay. I haven't been able to find, I went to the, Interna uh, I went to the uh, AGFA and asked if anyone has archives of sawfish photographs. And I've talked to a number of fishing clubs, but no one seems to have it. And it's surprising, because I would have thought somebody would have the turn of the century photograph. So if you know anybody, old photographs of sawfish are important data for us. In fact, they knew that sawfish were, get, had live births from a postcard showing a mother, and it said, just birth babies. And the babies were lying on, on her side. And that was discovered in 2000, kids who don't think you can discover anything. We didn't even know that until 2000. So. Um, Let's see, next slide. So what you can do to help. If you see a sawfish, one, and I don't know why they didn't pick 800, you know, because I'm dyslexic, I'm never, I don't have trouble. one 844 sawfish If you can't remember that, you can contact me, Tom Jackson, or you can contact the Rosensteel School, tell them you saw a sawfish, we'll, we'll get you in contact with the people you need to. But please let people know, um, it is really important. And don't bring them to the boat. Make sure you cut the lines. Don't have people positioning them for photographs. If they do that and they post it, there's a good chance they're going to go to jail. And nobody wants to spend time doing that. Uh, and in closing, I'd like to say thank you. I, this, this is my old, my old Aquaman when I was a kid. It's funny because actually I have a friend of mine that's making jewelry right now for Jason Momoa and his, his new wife, Lisa Bonet. But uh, I'm the old Aquaman guy from the old days. And be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. So please feel free, especially the kids, because. Never be afraid of asking questions, uh, unless it's like you've asked it a third time, then you're stupid. But the first few times, not so much. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't know. Are they called batches or litters, or how many does a mother have at a time? Uh, I do know this. That, uh, it's not a thousand. It's more like no, a no, 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 no. Oh, yes. No, they're, 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 they're care selected. So it's, yes, so it's a small number of babies. They don't produce a large number of offspring. All the sharks, all the elasmobranchs produce a very small number of offspring. That's one of the problems with them. Except for, well, some of the like, blue sharks actually produce a lot of babies, but, but, but they produce them constantly. So it's kind of an odd. Well, now, that's the next question, the follow-up. Is she capable of producing several Litters? What are they called? Well, uh, it would be, I guess it would be a litter. That's a good question. Uh, in, in, no, it would be one in a year. Just one. Yeah, there wouldn't be multiple. I, I, I don't even remember, because I have friends that breed freshwater stingrays. So I have my past experiences actually with freshwater stingrays, because in the pet trade, we keep them. And uh, I've never remembered any double clutching from, from any of the stingrays, be or any of those. Uh, the, the, the reproductive events have been just really lucky. Out of 140, sawfish in Florida that they've taken DNA from, 4% were parthenogenic, meaning they, they came from a mother that had no father. Okay, So that's only 4%, but that's still you know, a part of the population. Um, I've been on Biscayne Bay for about 65 years, and when I was a kid... I'm jealous. 
<laughs> I'm jealous. My father was supposed to move me here in 73. I'm the marine biologist. My brother was born in Aruba. My father moved here with me in 52. Ah. But we would go, uh, we had this little Boston whaler. We would go down to Black Ledge, which is not far from the area you're talking about, to catch mackerel, particularly in the winter mm -hmm. time, because back then you could walk, practically walk on them. And the sawfish would come around, they were a pain in the butt. You know, and uh, they would come around and interfere with our fishing. Sometimes we'd be two or three of them around. We'd have to move. Wow. You know, of course, I haven't seen a sawfish. In a long time. It's been a long time. Years, years. Yeah. But that's how prevalent they used to be. They were around all the time. I thought it was funny because one time I was out in the middle of the bay and I said to the, the students, "I'm like, there's a crocodile over there on the bottom of the bay." And they're like, "No, there's not." I'm like, "Okay, yeah, look." Sure enough, like right in the middle of the bay, there was one of the American crocodiles just sitting there on the bottom. It's one of the most odd things I've seen. Yeah, we have uh, we have about six or seven in the Virginia Key, Key Biscayne area. Mm -hmm. Sawfish? No, crocodiles. Oh, crocodiles. Mm -hmm. oh yeah, they're in uh, the quiet gardens eating all the duck eggs. Well, they shouldn't be eating eggs. There's something else eating your eggs. Uh, they'll eat the the baby ducks like that, but the eggs, raccoons. You got raccoons? Yeah, probably. But it's the, the ducks are disappearing, babies, the, the crocodiles. Yeah, it's a catch me too because the, the crocodiles are kind of like from Florida. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a six of one half dozen the other. Uh, you know, one of the things that I will say is when I, when I was here, there were the ladies that were bringing all the birds to the park. Let me explain to you why it's not good to have peacocks and things in your neighborhood. Oh. <laughs> or cats in your neighborhood. Well, no, no, if you want, if you have unnatural populations of an animal, uh, peacocks is the example for what we're talking about here. Peacocks are from Southeast Asia. What do you think the diversity is where peacocks come from? I mean, insofar as the number of organisms. It's inordinately higher than here. So whenever you take an organism that's adapted to these environments and you bring it to another environment, it's bringing that biome with it. So just as Columbus had some protection from flus, there's the possibility. Now, it turns out the peacocks are actually very susceptible to West Nile virus. And, and in Boston, I think, when they first had a West Nile virus outbreak at the zoo, the peacocks were the first to go. But in some cases, some of these diseases, these animals can carry asymptomatically, and then our, our you know, animals disappear. No one has been able to tell me why the robins disappeared in 1999 to 2001, why we quit seeing robins in our yards. I haven't seen a bat in my yard in 11 years. I haven't seen a scorpion in my yard in 10 years. And I look for these things. I'm, like, I'm bored. If, I've, if I'm at your cocktail party, I'm going to go in the backyard and flip your stones and look for stuff. That's what I do. Um, but, the, but it's just interesting that, that a lot of these things are disappearing. I don't know why. Uh, but but having, these, having these exotic animals that we sell that are this big, that have been exposed to animals from around the world, and that end up in our native lands, we're exposing our native lands to whatever the exposure chain was. From the point of origin, to when it gets out. And if you're looking at a fish, that fish is in an, in an open filtration system with fish that are exposed from fish from around the world in cramped conditions. At every step, they have found 13 antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria in aquarium, freshwater aquarium angelfish in Miami. It's a publication that came out three years ago. So we don't, and these are for things that like, not like tetracycline, things that we would use in the trade. We're talking about things like Cipro things that, that we sh shouldn't be seeing in, in aquarium fish. So those kinds of exposures are happening um, in trade. And, and having all these things that we release into our environment, selling all these things that eventually get too big, selling things that they don't even sell a container for at half of its life cycle guarantees these exposures to your state. So you know it, it wasn't really surprising with the number of snakes that get to be 12 feet and bigger that they would eventually be released. Because you know what happens? Not with my grandchild, you know, not with me in the relationship. I, I got a letter at one point in time from my, from my home insurance company that they would not renew my homeowner's insurance. And I, I took snakes to schools. So I had an outreach program. They would not renew my homeowner's insurance if I had a snake. Now, if that happened to a bunch of people in Florida, what do you think happened to those snakes? So Florida has a very close relationship with the animal industries. And uh, I hope at some point in time that that will change. Um, I'll tell you though, it's been, it's, been, it's been very dismal working on invasive species because nothing goes well. It's been very wonderful working with these young people. And Laura's come on the most recently as a PhD student. Because this project has been one of the few things I can say that when we started, we had no expectations of success. And we've been 
more successful than we've expected. And, and the fact array was so happy with their work that they've added another three years onto them having the equipment. So these young people have done a really good job. And it looks like we have some positive results. Fingers crossed that we get some more in the future. Um, keep your eyes open for sawfish. And just keep your eyes open. Go outside. Did y'all hear about the vitamin D pills don't work? Go get some sun. <laughs> get some real vitamin D. What happened to all the iguanas that used to be around here? Uh, well, I, I, well, I mean, sometimes they have cleanouts. They do have cleanouts. Uh, I don't know if they didn't keep us game. But I'll tell you this much. There used to be a beautiful hibiscus collection at, the, at Fairchild Tropical Garden. They, they think they're good. That's the first thing they love to eat. They love to eat hibiscus. I had an iguana that was in commercials when in the, in the 80s, if you ever saw an NCL ad with a boat in the distance and an iguana on a stick, that was my iguana. I used to get um, as much as $800 an hour photo time. Uh, it's interesting that like all animals, you know, they have different personalities just like dogs and cats. And at some point in time, this male iguana got to be aggressive and turned on me and would never change. And you know, what do you do with an iguana? This iguana was, was from there to here with a full length tail because his tail never broke it. It was 17 pounds. <laughs> he, I went on a Christmas vacation and he wasn't eating and a friend of mine shoved a carrot in his mouth, scratched the top of his mouth and their brain is actually very close to that. So he actually get, got a palatine bone infection and it went right up into his brain and killed him. And the, doc, the vet called me and there was going to be a big festival, a music festival, and I was supposed to show up with Goblin and people were all upset and people you know, left money. And I said, well, give the money to the zoo or give the money to the... Uh, to the uh, you know, animal foundation that we have in town. But I get those calls. I have, a, I have a toke gecko in my house that somebody left in a bird cage. It said, we heard you're the guy. And when I did a National Geographic article on invasive species, <laughs> the lady left my, my house and there was a trash can. And I said, don't open that. And literally there was. There was a, a, an eight foot Burmese python that wasn't friendly that somebody left in a trash can in my front porch. I'm curious about something. <laughs> Potential. We don't, we don't know there is. Yeah, yeah. The, the conditions are there. The conditions that have been defined are the same on both places, but the fresh water is the only, the only difference. But now that we have that. It's changed quite a bit, right? So, so the sawfish themselves, do we know, do they tend to stay coastal or are they pelagic at all? That's one of the reasons why the, the, there's questions about the data. So, yeah, they do. They, we, we know that they go out oceanic. They spend more time um, near the coast. So they're birthed in an estuary and they have to move out. Yeah. So, like, the thought right yeah. now is that actually Biscayne Bay is potentially a migratory um, corridor. So they just seem to be moving up and down along the coast. But they, like the ones, I mean, we don't have an array. Like, what's our deepest? But they cross over to the Bahamas. The Bahamas, yeah. yeah. They do. Yeah. But in terms of where we're detecting them, it's not super deep, right? But isn't this interesting? See, we, see, we don't know. We, we're, 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 this is how there is so much we don't know about a, a 15 foot animal, you know, that used to be so common that it was had trouble going fishing. There's a lot of sharks around the yacht club. There's sharks everywhere. Listen, no shark story. We had two divers in. When was it? Uh, let's see. It was March. I think it was the 14th. We were behind the sea aquarium. Did you hear that? Yeah. yeah. He was, yeah. So, so we get behind the sea aquarium, and so there's a platform there, and the, the, we have a receiver that's down there, and the two divers had to go down. So, the, so there's, a kind of, there's kind of a boat fishing over there, and I don't know if you know this, there's a lot of bull sharks behind the sea aquarium. So they go down, and then some guy comes back from the back of the sea aquarium with two buckets. He walks up to the edge, he goes, and it's blood. It's like fish guts and blood, and we're like, no. And here comes the boat. Boat's going through with his fish lines. You know, we're like, oh, please have a nice day, everything, happy place. They come up, they're fine. They download the receivers. The bull sharks were doing this. We taste like styrofoam. I don't think they really want, if they wanted to eat us, you know, they would be eating us. I, I, some of you were here earlier. I had to do a, I had to sit in for George Burgess in 2002 when Florida had a rash of shark attacks. And it was, it's that during the time of year where they're, they're migrating south and shore and, and literally, this is true. If you, if you look at, there, there's a statistics for how people are put in the hospital. You're more likely to be put in the hospital from a serious toilet seat accident 
than a shark attack. Now, it doesn't specify what the serious toilet seat accidents are. I don't want to know. But those are statistics that are out there. And you know, everyone's got a toilet. And, and the hippies, if the hippies, the hippies, if we lived in Arizona, my parents had a house in Sedona, and it was so funny to watch the hippies in their, in their flip flops. They'd go up the sandstone, and then you'd get up, and they can't go back down. So, you know, we'd have to go up and hike and bring up shoes and put shoes on them or spend the night and come back down with them. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that, I, I've never been there. Have you been there, Irish Rock? Oh, I was supposed to go in 2014. I saved 20 years of my vacation time, and my mom got glioblastoma, and I lost her that year. Same thing that happened in McCain. So uh, I lost both my parents that year. Well, it was a busy year. Because you get there doesn't mean you can climb it because the wind was 50 miles away. Oh, absolutely. Top. Yeah. So, and all, all there is, you can climb up pretty easily, like you say. And the last part is pretty steep, and there's a chain. And that's what you hold on to. Yeah. On top, there's nothing. Yeah. It's a big sandstone. So there's nothing to hold on to. There's no vegetation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a tabletop. So I was I'm just glad we didn't actually end up doing that to Virginia Key after Ultra, because I, well, I live right, or I work right next to it. I walked out, I'm like, ah, oh, please, I hope everything's going to be okay afterwards. The most venomous animals, some of the craziest venomous animals are in that area of Australia. Yeah, they're, they're and thankfully, you cannot you sell Australian animals. I'll tell you a funny joke. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. Neither stupid, it's the habitat. And unfortunately, habitat research is about as common as dodo birds. The funding, the interest in funding, in looking at the environment. I mean, here we are in a state where they cut back testing where the worst red tides were on the West Coast by 25% in that one location. Why? You'd think you'd want more. Um, you know, her daughter watched the coral die. I, went, I did it with her. I saw 94% of the coral die in the state of Florida from the time I got here. Uh, you know, we need, I mean, I hope SERP works. I hope we end up with a cleaner bay. Okay, so you talked about at the beginning, um, you know, the, the decline of, of the sawfish. You know, people would hunt them to cut off their saw or, you know, sport fishing or, or whatever. And then there's also habitat loss and all these reasons for their, their populations to decline. And, you know, recently you've been seeing that there's been more frequent sightings, so it kind of seems like their numbers may be increasing, or there might be a nursery, or, or you know, whatever the. Oh, there are definitely nurseries on the west coast. I mean, they've had they've had three reproductive right, events. But you're in Florida, you're not sure. Meaning but west coast, of, west coast of Florida. Florida. Oh, west coast of Florida. Florida. Okay, yeah. Um, but okay, so so habitat hasn't improved. Um, I, I mean, people are, are certainly you know sport fishing them in Florida. You're not sure. Meaning west coast of west coast of Florida. Oh, west coast of Florida. Okay, yeah. Oh, so habitat hasn't improved. Um, I, I mean, people are, are certainly, you know, sport fishing the flesh. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I still don't understand why. If you had a gigantic chemo sensor on your pole, you would go to what they do. I don't understand. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. So, so I mean, the habitat hasn't gotten any better. It's still in decline. Um, and people obviously aren't sport fishing them anymore because they're not allowed to. So, in theory, people aren't cutting off their saws, right. hopefully. Well, then the trade's um, not there anymore. But then, so, but if their habitat is still in decline, do you have any thoughts or ideas as to why it's possible that their population is, is well, they, they Since they found the places on the west coast and they did put those aside for protected uh, as protected areas, so they have allowed, uh, the, we've had since 1994 since the, the gillnet ban, so we've had a number of generations now of sawfish since that time. More offspring have been produced on the west coast uh, and, and so that's why you know, we're hoping that we'll get a repopulation around and adults coming in and, and because there was historically from what I understand, in Biscayne Bay and in Indian River, there were sawfish that came in and had babies here. I've talked to a couple old timers that said, yes, that's, that's something that they didn't, that was not out of the question down here. The problem is, is, is there's no photographs from then. It's all anecdotal information. Kind of like when I told them that, that particularly the pythons eat people. And then when I gave them the scientific paper, they still didn't believe me. But, um, well, they're taking a picture because they saw them all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, go, go out to Loop Road. If you, or go out to, uh, Snake Road at like 2 o'clock in the morning this time of year if you want to see snakes. There's, there's plenty of snakes out there if you want to go find snakes. There are. There are small tooth sawfish in the Bahamas. In fact, in 2014 in, An in Andros, they had uh, in the, I, think, I can't remember the name of the aquarium there, that's where they had the first birth. So they're female produced babies. And I don't think anyone looked at those yet insofar as whether or not they were parthenogenic. I don't know if that was a sawfish that was kept with other sawfish. 
I, I looked at moving to the Bahamas, but it was the it was Irma, the last hurricane. I'm like, I'm done. I can't deal with the Caribbean anymore. I'm going to the Pacific. By the way, did they release those babies, or are they? No, they. I don't think so. I think they kept them in the in the aquarium. Uh, I was going to say, turkeys and Komodo dragons are both carcinogenic and produce male offspring. Yeah, and and you could buy Komodo dragons for 500 bucks when I moved here. They closed Komodo Island. People. They did because you know why? Why and why was that? Yes, people weren't taking them and selling them. People weren't taking them and selling them. There was a blue monitor. If you type in blue monitor lizard, you'll see it. When, when it was discovered, I told the guy, I said, I give it three months, it'll be for sale in Miami. It was about four months, $3,900. Comes from an island this big. You, you know, there probably are none left. If, you, if I'm seeing one in Miami, there's got to be one in Los Angeles. There's got to be one in Antwerp. There's got to be one. So... I think there's a, there's a change, though, in the next generation is kind of getting the idea of some of these of exotic pets not being the most best thing. You know, I mean, my sister said to me at one point, she said, why do you keep these things in cages? They don't get to have a life. You know, I never really thought about that. Animals do have social lives. Reptiles actually have social lives. If you ever have a black racer, have you ever seen black racers in your yard? If you see that snake at 10 o'clock, you go out tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you will see that snake come through the same area because they have territories. You know, and my friend actually, for the first time in all of his life, he's, he's from Santa Clara, Cuba. He's been here most of his life. He saw two of, this, two of them fighting in his backyard. I've never seen that in all the times I've seen them. I've seen, I've seen more than that. I live in Fort Lauderdale. My son and I were together. We counted 13. Nice. Nice. Well, you know, and it, it, they eat a lot of rats. They eat a lot of mice. Yeah. It's a good yeah. thing to have around. And by the way, if you do have snakes and you take your snake skins and you put them on your mango tree, the squirrels won't touch your mangoes. I was trying to, to get people to extract the oils out of them to use them for, you know, any predatory compounds. Any other questions? Where are the uh, sawfish found in uh, the west coast of Florida? Oh, they're, they're actually, they're, sawfish are found circumglobally from, uh, let's see, it would be about North Carolina, South Carolina, on to central Brazil. And then all the way across to Africa, there are species in both coasts of Africa, species in Asia. I'm not sure if there still is one in India. Um, there was one they thought was freshwater in the Mekong River. No one's seen that one for a long time. Um, it looked more like a ray. It actually had a bigger dorsal fin connected to the, to the saw. It was a long time ago. Um, but they're basically circumglobal in the tropical and, and sub-temperate zone. The, the west coast of Florida. Oh, Fort Myers, Tampa, all the way up. We see it all right there. Yeah, I mean, f from Key West to, to Galveston. But to in the, in the bay and not in the, not in the rivers. Um, well, that's where the babies show up. Yeah. Peace River is where they found the babies, and May, what was her name? Something May, uh, was a lady that actually photographed the ones in the Peace River. And there's a guy named Dennis Giardina who works for FWC. He's the coolest biologist in the state. If they find a Florida panther in a tree, like on the, on the uh, alligator alley, if they call him. He climbs the tree with a syringe. Oh, he did that just recently. He was in the newspaper. That was your buddy? I used to play with crazy poison snakes intoxicated as a young man, okay? I would never do that. <laughs> There's no way. Uh, okay, so here, okay. <laughs> who reads all this data that comes in? So this, this particular water data is, yeah. is a number of, these are water monitoring stations <laughs> for Biscayne National Park. They're recording all day. I get a big Excel file, and it gives me the date time stamp, and then it gives me a number. And then I have to cross-reference cross that number to what fish or animal that is. So then I just see, you know, they're at Deering Estate at 1230 on Monday. Or then they'll go up to see Quarian on Tuesday. So that's basically what I see. But I can only see when they pass by those specific places. So they have to pass when this? Same one. They must Each one's a different frequency. Same so number. Yeah. I'll tag shark one, two, three, four. And then when I download the data, I'll see, oh, shark one, two, three, four was here. And one, two, three, four corresponds to a frequency. Well, when they called me the first time and said, we got sawfish, I'm like, I can't wait to say I told you so. Who's first? So, sh so these guys tag sharks. I was at a talk for Burmese pythons where they, they, they tag and track them and follow them across the Everglades. This is a true statistic, okay? This is why I don't go out looking for pythons and I used to keep them. Ten-foot snakes that are radio collared, 97% of the time cannot be found at 10 foot of distance. The one thing I told them, having dismantled every appliance imaginable and two cars, because I've had snakes get out and everything, 
toilets, wallboard, uh, is that you could have one in a three by three foot space in a in a one of those little brown refrigerators, and you can't find it. And you'll put that if you put a mouse in an aquarium and you wait till morning, he's going to be the he's going to be in the tank eating the mouse. It is amazing the spaces they can fit into and hide in. So. I would not want to be Lori Oberhoff's python dog. I mean, that's the crappiest job in Florida. The, I'm the dog that goes and sniffs her pythons, and they're looking for 14-foot pythons, and they can't find them at 10-foot of distance, even when they have a That's like a death sentence. I don't want to, I'm not doing that. There was actually a young lady, uh, I think it was five years ago in, in, at Flamingo in Everglades National Park, came over, told a ranger, and it was a 14-foot reticulated python. That snake would have. Was that successful when they hired people to go out or dig a no. thousand? Ah. No, because, well, you know what's funny? You guys remember when they got the guys from India? Yeah. I told them that in the beginning. I'm like, go to Sri Lanka. These, have you seen the picture of the babies with the pythons? That's where they live. These people have relationships with snakes. Go talk to these people. Well, when they finally did, the guys over there realized, hmm, we can charge them more money. And so there was no way to really do it. If they had done it in the beginning, they could have. But it was such an international story. They're like, well, you know, you're flying. You want to pay me pennies, which is typical in Florida. Um, but they were the ones that, that but you cannot extract animals. It's very rare for us to get. We got lucky with the Gambian pouch rat. I'll tell you that. It carries 15 human diseases, and it would have decimated our agriculture. So we got lucky that the lady that had them on Grassy Key, these are 25-inch rats that can carry a grapefruit in each cheek mouth and carry all kinds of human diseases. She was, raising? she was raising them, and they got out, and they were all over Grassy Key. So thankfully, Dennis and a number of other people got them. And there was a, some hurricane around that time, and they were thankful because they, they were moving wood to the mainland. And if they had had them in the wood, it would have been a problem. So they were actually made illegal because they transferred a disease to prairie dogs. And in five states in this country, people got an, a monkey disease. So um, uh, actually, kind of an interesting parallel. Remember the people coming and wanting to release Lolita? You know why that's a bad idea? Because we've taken Lolita, and we've put her in a place now where she's been exposed to antibiotic resistant stuff, right, for decades, and, and in captivity. And then they want to put her in the Pacific and expose those animals to whatever. You know, we've been injecting her with stuff. It's just not a good idea. I mean, it sounds like a good idea to reunite families, but you might end up killing the family just like Columbus going back with whatever he brought back with to Europe. Same problem. Say the snake project wasn't successful? Would they pay people $1,000 to I made a bet. I made a bet to Reef in 2008 that if they could clear lionfish out of any place in, in the Caribbean, I would give them $20,000 of my own money. I've made the same claim for, for snakes for more than 10 years because I couldn't do it in my house. And people have been calling me about it for 30 years. Tom, the boa is loose in our house. Can you come over? We used to, have, we used to, be, we used to be gerbil, hamster, guinea pig heaven, too. Because you know when you buy two, they end up, yeah. And it is a shame. In my office at Rasmus, I used to see that Lita in that small container every day. And you know, not my not my personal not my personal preference. If I would want, I'd rather have it. But it is what it is. I was hoping they were going to expand. I thought actually at some point in time, because actually the, the last concert that was at Marine Stadium, I DJ. It was Gregory Isaacs and another guy. It was a reggae show. But I thought that, that they were going to expand to see Aquarium over there, and then eventually, you know, we'd have something really nice in the city. Um, I'm still not exactly sure what they're going to do with the Marine Stadium. It's going to kind of sit there, and they're yeah, going to build. For the boat show. And they're going to build stuff. But nobody sits. Do they sit in the, in the stadium itself? No. Anybody else? Any questions? At least we got the concert out of the wildlife area. Oh, did you go to Jimmy Buffett's concert there? I used to see him. He used to come in and play for us in the, in the bars in Galveston, like come in and play. It was nice. This was in the, in the 80s, a long time ago. Anybody else have any questions? Thank you. Really? Well, Cheers. Great.